Extrasensory perception, or ESP, has long been the stuff of public fantasy and media exploitation. Countless books, movies, and TV shows captivate audiences with sensational tales of psychic phenomena and unexplained events. But there is a serious side of ESP. Careful research conducted by university labs and government agencies. They've asked, can we spy on our enemies with ESP? View images without seeing them? Heal psychically? Cure illness through prayer? But maybe ESP is just wishful thinking, sloppy science, clever conjuring, or outright fraud. Maybe the public is just being duped. Next, on Closer to Truth, can ESP affect your life? Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm Robert Kuhn. ESP and psychic phenomena can make great television. As we watch, we wonder, wow, what if that's true? If ESP is real, then it should be big news. But why so many critics and skeptics? On this edition of Closer to Truth, we've invited some of the best scientists on both sides of a contentious issue to share their strong opinions. Dr. Marilyn Schlitz is Director of Research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and an authority on remote viewing. Dr. Barry Beierstein, a leading skeptic, is a professor of psychology at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Dr. Charles Tart, a psychologist, is a pioneer in the application of scientific methodology to ESP research. Dr. James Treffel, is professor of physics at George Mason University and an author of popular science books. And Dr. Dean Radin is an experimental psychologist who is skeptical about skeptics. Marilyn, what are some of the ways in which ESP can affect our lives? Well, it may be a little premature to think about the actual mm -hmm. application of parapsychological phenomena since it's still in the research gathering stage, but some possible applications include healing. I think this is a direction where the idea that the belief system or intention of the healer may influence a patient, even at a distance, even under conditions where uh, the patient doesn't know that they're having good thoughts thought for them at a distance. This is um, not just psychosomatic medicine where the mind influences the body exactly. hormonally. Exactly. I think this is a step beyond the notion of a placebo kind of response and actually some kind of distant intentionality effect on uh, physical systems. Define distant intentionality. Well, the idea that one person's thoughts may be able to influence the physiology of another person at a distance, it's a, a kind of claim that's made very generally in the population of the world. Uh, many healers in many different cultures believe they can heal people at a distance. I'm kind of relaxed right now. You're doing that to me? <laughs> uh, I think there are other ways. Uh, crime detection. Uh, certainly psychics are brought in on a regular basis in many police departments. Uh, I think that uh, many uh, detectives will tell you that they will try anything to solve a case and sometimes a psychic can give them the, the added edge that will help them to come up with a novel explanation and frequently to solve a, a crime. There are Bar a variety of directions. Barry, uh, as a skeptic, don't you think that the only way ESP affects our lives is by wasting our time and taking our money? Well, uh, first of all, we have to establish whether there's ESP or not. And, and you know, I don't put the experimental parapsychologists who are looking for this in the same in category as the psychics who pester police departments and I think do pester them and waste their time and uh, I have some personal knowledge of this in a particular case and I've read others and I think it, it probably is the case that uh, there are more uh, noise in the system really as far as the police are concerned but and, uh, the, the real question I guess we should get to is if ESP exists I think the experimental parapsychologists think it's a tiny tiny effect and probably doesn't scale up into the real world. And but if there is a tiny effect doesn't that significantly change our world? Here? Absolutely if, it, if it's there and it cannot be explained by prosaic means well then it, it does change our, our worldview in significant ways and that's why 
you know, we say as skeptics, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence, that it is such a fundamental change in the worldview of the scientific worldview that uh, we have to make sure all the dots are on the I's and all the crosses are on the T's before we make that leap. Charles, you're one of the leaders in the field. Do you believe that everyone has these abilities and can we develop them? Well, if I say everyone has it, that is a matter of belief because, of course, everyone hasn't been tested. But I see no reason not to assume it's a fundamental human talent, but it does need to develop. As uh, Barry mentioned a moment ago, if we have it, it's usually a very small-scale phenomena. That's why I wrote a book called Learning to Use ESP. To but see. can you learn? Can you show developmental increase of uh, ability over time with any kind of training? My best guess is that we can, but there hasn't been enough research to show that. But that really is our fundamental need, to get this ESP ability up to where you can demonstrably use it at will. But do you have experiments where you have an increasing level of performance? Yes. Jim, in your many books, such as The Edge of the Unknown and Are We Unique, you scan the frontiers of science. Mm -hmm. Do you see a ESP on the frontiers? Well, not really. I uh, uh, see it as a, uh, something that's been around. It, if the effects are there, as everyone has said, they're very small. Uh, they haven't been demonstrated, I think, to the uh, satisfaction of uh, mainstream scientific community. And my best guess is that probably things aren't going to change, uh, that they'll stay there. Dean? I wonder if I could just address this question, because mm -hmm. several people have mentioned the, the small effect size. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that um, has been well established in conventional medicine, for example, is the use of aspirin to prevent second heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Well, the effect size in that study is very small. But across a very large sample size, they actually stopped that study prematurely because they felt that they were depriving the control group of a, a viable treatment. Sure, but there's a big difference there, and that is that we understand what aspirin does, and, and there's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis to be generated from the a molecular function of, of, of aspirin to an effect on but the cardiovascular system. But do you have to know mechanism to uh, appreciate an experimental result? No, you don't have to, but I'm, I'm saying in, that in this particular case, we have a theory, and, and that was a predictable outcome of the theory, and it turns out to be a small effect, so you do need a large sample size because there's or um, is statistical variability in, in, in the population. But are you saying that the evidence for psi phenomena is stronger than the evidence for aspirin preventing a second I'm heart not attack? saying it's stronger. I'm saying that when we talk about these kind of effect sizes being small, almost with the back of our hand dismissing it, I would say that the same thing is true about many of the different kind of modalities that we accept as given within conventional medicine, uh, and that the, the goal really, I think, is to begin to harness these things in such a way that they have better applicability. Dean, in your book, The Conscious Universe, you go after the skeptics uh, pretty tough. Uh, do you feel threatened by them? Not so much that I feel threatened, but that I'm also skeptical about skepticism. In other words, skepticism is truly a double-edged sword. It is usually thought of as, as kind of hacking away at things that you wish to debunk. And most of it is easy to debunk, because it's, it's obvious in some cases they're just people fooling themselves. But you also need to cut in the other direction and take a very careful look at what are the skeptical tactics and rhetoric that are used to try to explain something away. And so I, I did look at it fairly closely in my book and discovered that in many cases, skeptical arguments, at least against parapsychological phenomena, are flawed. Charles, uh, are there any common characteristics for high ESP incidents? No, I don't think so. There has been a fair That's amount of study on personality correlates of people mm -hmm. who score a little mm -hmm. higher and a little lower, and they come out just sort of significant, but not very large practically. I, I couldn't say this kind of person has high ESP. Or this kind of situation, kind of or uh, there, there are no specific characteristics that you can predictively use to see not high Not predict in a terribly practical sense, but there is one that's especially interesting. <laughs> even if it's a small size effect, and that is if you take people who don't believe in ESP versus those who believe in it, mm -hmm. you find this out before you give them an ESP test. You call 